Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, can everyone see the presentation? Get a thumbs up, okay. All right, so um, we're here today to talk about James Bond and all things that are James Bond. Uh, <laughs> No, I um, use this, uh, the presentation is Goldfinger, uh, 007 Goldfinger, the secret agent for student success. Um, really, we're taking a look at um, how you can develop as uh, what's known as an institutional agent and uh, help students develop the capital necessary to be uh, successful in college. So it's looking at both the social capital framework but we'll also be um, exploring Yoso's model of uh, community cultural wealth. Um, so some of this may be a little dense at times. Um, so I'm gonna get started so we have time to get through it. Um, if you have any questions that pop up, uh, just put them in the chat. And uh, Bill, if you notice any, just uh, flag me down because I tend to go on a run sometimes. So um, and we'll also have a little bit of time, hopefully at the end for Q&A. And you can always email me if you have any other that come up. Um, so, uh, talking a little bit about capital um, really is what this is about. Um, so, what I use in terms of capital is the idea of its ability to get something done. So, there's three different types of capital that I generally talk about with students. Um, I always say that capital is the reason that students go to college in general. Um, the first one that people think about it capital is physical capital. That's just money um, as a way to get things done. If you throw enough money at about anything, it'll probably get something done. Um, intellectual capital is the reason why most people like to say that, uh, that we hope students go to college is that the, by going to college, you learn new ways and to get things that you want done done. Um, social capital is one that it, I think is significantly undervalued in higher education, both from um, what it provides you after college, but also the success and access in navigating college. Um, social capital is a key piece of um, navigating. It's, it's, you know, that whole idea of it's not what you know, but who you know. Um, I always, in, encourage my students to meet closely with their faculty um, in whatever degree they're interested in because those are resources to uh, develop and uh, get you jobs down the road or get you scholarships or just give you more knowledge. Um, so I'm not gonna read this whole definition, but um, the concept I'm using for social capital really just um, is about being a part of some group that gives you access to whatever that capital that that group has. So it's not just money, it just um, whatever type of credit that uh, it gives you um, to be able to do things. Um, so uh, yeah, I wanna start out with just a little discussion as I mentioned, um, just about what some of the unwritten rules of college are. So anyone can speak up. Um, I just wanna take a couple minutes for this. You can put it in the chat if you need to. Um, any ideas of anything that students need to know to navigate college. So that could be, that's not like explicitly stated in the syllabus. So, or if it's in your syllabus, something that you know is missing from other syllabi um, or just something that students need to know to be successful. Just to back up a little bit, just to even apply and, and, and roll into college, uh, I think our language in higher ed, a lot of times people don't understand it, right? They don't understand. We have a lot of acronyms. We have FAFSA. We have, you know, we and then we call one business uh, class this and call that. So part of your uh, the unwritten rules is understanding the language um, that higher ed does have and present. And then once you're in the classroom, too, is um, you know, especially first generational uh, students might not understand what a syllabus is and how to follow it. And um, yeah, we we're hoping everyone understands how to read. I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying just understand the language, the words being used. No, I agree with that 100%. You touched on many of the key points that are difficult, like all the acronyms are huge, but yeah, like 
syllabus like that outside of academia that's not a term that's used very often so students knowing that they are supposed to read the syllabus before class starts like or like even knowing what a syllabus is knowing what the different terms mean is a or huge syllabi yeah know? syllabi yeah. <laughs> either one it, I know because I've had that with a lot of students that have heard the term syllabus before, but when I talk about talk about in plurality, it's they get they have no idea what I'm talking about. Which class I should take, when and why? Time management. That's huge. Understanding the expectations of a college class of that is two hours for every hour that you're in class, two to three hours for every hour that you're in class. Um, is so something that is a foreign concept. Um, so those are all some great points. A few more I'd like to touch on. Um, one of my phrases I always use is that um, higher education culture is largely upper middle class white culture. So I'm going to say that again. Upper middle class white culture is the predominant culture that dominates higher education. So we accept a lot of these things as cultural norms without analyzing them or noting them. So things like how we access different resources and things like that, how we ad address different people, um, communication styles, but also communication formats. Um, even email etiquette is huge in higher education, you know, always having a subject line, letting people know who you are with an introduction. This was things that many students struggle with, um, but also uh, knowing that they have to call to schedule an appointment, knowing what office hours are. Um, anecdotally, I like to bring this up a lot that I've had multiple students uh, tell me that they thought office hours were times when the professors were busy in their office and didn't want to be disturbed. So they put that in the syllabus so they knew not to bother them during those times. You know, it, it's things like that that we don't take the time to analyze that, oh, this may not be coming across the way that we intend, or there may be some nuanced piece of my conversation. Um, the concept of calling professor or doctor versus uh, their first name or Mr. or Mrs. Um, you know, there's all these different things of, um, showing uh, concepts of respect that are um, that we accept that our version of respect is the correct version. Um, whereas where they may have a completely different concept of what respect is and feel disrespected frequently, um, but are still trying to show the utmost respect. So it could be a piece where both parties are being disrespected. Um, so yeah, just going into, just getting into that a little bit, um, I'm not going to harp too much on all these unwritten rules, but just know we have a lot of them that we don't acknowledge. Um, so I'm going to talk about deficit thinking versus asset-based thinking. Um, and so this really comes into that social capital concept. Um, that's a double-edged sword uh, because it shows both the we know that students are struggle with that in higher education in terms of having the social capital to easily navigate college. But when you're talking about the why um, that happens or the importance of it, there's a scholarship on both sides that um, shows how both lenses of it can be discriminatory if not, if you don't look into the nuances. So. Um, I'm not saying I have the definite answer for any of this stuff. I'm uh, going to provide a framework that shows you ways that we may be failing our students. Um, I'm going to look at uh, some positive ways to potentially reframe it, and then some concrete actions that we can take on a micro level with our students to be the institutional agents to help them get that capital. So uh, to start us off, uh, deficit thinking. Uh, you can see the definition at the top. Um, there's di different definitions of it. The um, researchers on there have done some work in recent years to try to um, come up with more concrete definitions so they have the way, same working concept. Um, but it's based on these four areas, essentially. Um, it has a blame the victim orientation. So uh, we tend to blame students for their struggles. 
Uh, we want to look at their individual traits, um, lack of time management skills, um, lack of motivation, potentially work ethic, um, all, all these different things, or we blame the culture. Um, there is a common misconception that African American and uh, Latino families tend to place a lower value on education, um, even though the research shows that they actually place a higher value on uh, their children's education than white families um, and the importance of education. So, you know, there's different things like that that we look at um, to try to, as a self-preservation mechanism to look at, we don't want to take the blame for why our systems may be failing these students. We, as a individualistic society in America, we want to um, place the blame on the shoulders of the people who are getting the failing grades and things like that. Um, it's grounded in a larger complex system of oppression, anchored in meritocracy and colorblindness. So this really comes to like SATs, ACT scores, the high stakes testing. Um, we want to look at our placement test scores in math and reading and um, we obviously know that we as an institution are failing our minoritized students at disproportionate rates. Um, now, looking at it statistically, we may want to try to explain some of that away as them, uh, many of them may be testing into IRW 97 or Math 97 or, or different things like that. Um, but that, that's ignoring numerous factors out from school system to um, discrimination in standardized testing to lack of resources, different things like that. Um, so I, I said this is sort of a nuanced subject um, because while we don't want to blame individuals or cultures, it is still important to recognize the systems that are in play uh, that disadvantage them, such as K through 12 education. At the same time, we don't want to discriminate against students from certain school districts. So we don't want to have the same implicit bias against all GRPS students or something like that because of that. Um, a pervasive and also often implicit nature. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we take for granted what our cultural values, assumptions, and language are. Um, everyone has their own accent everyone has an accent in how they're thinking. So they have their own paradigm and lens through which they see things. Um, and we build our policy and practice and discourse around what we view as our cultural norms. Um, and unfortunately, there tend not to be enough diverse perspectives shared to really challenge that structure in higher ed or K through 12 or any system you wanna name in America. Um, and they have effects that reinforce hegemonic systems. So um, I'll get to the lowered expectations in a bit, um, but we, these, re this reinforcement of the systems tend to mask how they undermine success and they tend to predispose the students to disengagement because they, it's hard to keep that belief that you will be able to break through a system that is trying to keep you down. So as far as deficit thinking, um, it plays into both policy that we create and implicit bias. Um, and I'm gonna preface my, this slide with, um, these terms may be necessary at times, um, especially in the research. So if you see research that uses this, don't necessarily discredit it. There is significant scholarship on, this, on these subjects that are anti-deficit in nature, but it's important, uh, like I said, that you look to see if it is falling under those four cat categories I previously presented. Um, At-risk students really looks at a centuries, uh, century old term really about the youth that were causing problems in the streets, essentially. Um, and that still continues in higher ed discourse all the time, in education discourse in general. 
um, that we want to view the students as at risk. Um, it really, again, that is using deficit thinking to place the blame on them for being a problem um, that needs to be fixed, essentially. And um, it's important that we acknowledge that paradigm is often happening when we're having those conversations. So it's not that we have at-risk students. A lot of people have, re have been reframing them as at-risk schools and things like that because it is often the school that is putting these students at risk. Um, systematic bias and teacher expectations of African-American students. So there's research that shows that white teachers tend to have lower expectations of African-American students um, than others and when compared to African-American uh, teachers. So this is something that whether or not you have it, um, it, it's important for us all to acknowledge our biases. But whether or not you as a professor instructor have this bias, it's important to recognize that many of our students have faced this for their entire life. Um, and that 90% roughly of teachers are still white even at schools that are extremely more diverse than that. So there's a good chance that your student has been faced with many teachers that had lowered expectations for them than um, their peers. Um, and so I'll get later into the importance of uh, developing trust and closure with students when we talk about institutional agents, but this may be work that, there may be work that needs to be done um, from you as a professor to try to counteract this um, lack of trust that was being developed uh, or this, uh, yeah, these issues around trust that have developed for these students throughout the years. Um, grit is an important topic. Um, it can be detrimental in how it's discussed though. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm uh, Travis Steffens. I'm a success coach. I work for the College Success Center, specifically with our Chandler Scholars Program um, closely. Um, I talk with students about grit all the time. On an individual level, grit can be very important. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, it's sort of that uh, concept of stick to um, by Angela Duckworth, um, that students that are willing to just grind it out even when they're facing adversity. Um, and that can be an important tap, uh, concept for some students to understand about themselves, um, especially when it comes to distraction and knowing what they'll need to um, grind it out when other factors may come up. However, when you look at it from a policy lens, it, it can be extremely detrimental. Um, when you look at it, uh, that you expect students to have more grit, um, there's no real evidence that shows any interventions around grit are helpful. Um, we'll get later into Yoso's cultural community wealth model that uh, talks a little bit about aspirational capital and different things like that, um, that sort of touch on that point. But um, when it comes to implicit bias, um, there, if you're talking about grit from this perspective and you see someone failing, we need to recognize that in America, as an individualistic culture, we have that idea sort of ingrained in ourselves that if someone is failing, we tend to believe that it's on them that they're failing. And I'm not saying you should ever mark someone's grade up for struggling or anything like that, but um, placing the blame on them having a lack of grit uh, for being the reason that they dropped out, things like that, that is uh, often problematic. Um, language to expect expectations and dress code sort of go hand in hand. Um, our bias that uh, students that speak with an accent tend to have lower intelligence. Um, does anyone know what AAVE stands for? Anyone willing to stay, share in the chat or unmute themselves? No, okay. Um, it's African-American vernacular English. Um, so I mentioned we all speak with an accent. We all talk differently at different times. Um, it, it's this idea that there is a form of proper English, that in America, for some reason, we should be speaking the King's English still as the proper form. Um, there's 
a lot of bias at the very least and discrimination at worst um, that happens with when students speak outside of what is expected and to be proper English. So when students use African American vernacular English, but it also goes with uh, students that are bilingual. If they speak with an accent from another country or if they uh, speak Spanglish or uh, some uh, version of that, there is often a bias um, towards their intelligence, but also often uh, discrimination for that as well. Um, that correlates I don't, say, I don't want to say correlates, but um, it is a similar factor with dress code, um, this uh, lack of appreciation for different cultural garb, um, whether it's from another country or just a different culture's expectations of how you dress. Um, or, but even with dress code, that also goes with clothes owned. So like the, the concept of classism plays right into that too. So those that have less money are viewed to be less intelligent. Those that dress differently than what is expected in white upper middle class white or upper middle class white culture um, are viewed as less than many times. So now that we've got you at a low point, talk about all the problems going on. <laughs> let's uh, talk a little bit about an alternative way of thinking. Um, the asset-based thinking. So um, for those that know Eric Mullen, um, he is a big proponent of uh, Clifton Strength. I am as well. Um, Clifton, I'm Clifton Strength certified. So that's focusing on student strength versus um, their deficits. Um, so uh, we do offer workshops for that. Um, I'll be doing one in the spring. So you'll probably see some communication about that too. Um, but that can be hugely beneficial for students that have um, felt discriminated against throughout their education. Um, and there's a lot of research that shows pretty much everyone that's in developmental education courses has felt that at some point too. So um, we as a society tend to focus on our weaknesses or our deficits. Um, and that is problematic from a social psychology perspective, but also um, just from a neuroscience perspective. Um, the more time we spend focusing on our strengths, the more we can develop. Um, you know, I'm sure Dr. Forbes know, can back me up on all the neuroplasticity and um, the increase of bandwidth for developing, uh, focusing on your areas of strength, but we won't get into all that right now. Um, but really, this is um, about building that relationship uh, based on mutual benefit, respect, and power, um, and that democratization of education. So I talk a lot about a pedagogy of place. Um, with our students um, in our K-12 system, um, for the vast majority of them it is a situation where they've been sitting at a desk and the teacher is in the front of the room. That automatically, and the teachers are often standing where the students are sitting, is seated. Um, that often creates a power dynamic where it's the expectation that the teacher has the authority, which is understandable, and that they are the expert in the field and should not be questioned. Um, we have a lot of different ways that students are expected to be seen and not heard. Um, obviously, we, we aim for group discussion, group engagement, different things like that, but um, it's recognizing that students have a voice and in, in, in encouraging their power to take claim of their education. Um, and in doing so, it takes um, the release of some of that control by the professor. Uh, so I'm not saying you have to do a flipped classroom. I'm not even saying I've got the right answers for this, but um, recognizing that mutual benefit that you grow from the students as well, that their diverse perspectives are valued. I, I'm not claiming that they're going to be experts. Um, they're taking your class for a reason. You are expected to still be the expert and the knowledgeable uh, person in there. Um, but students need to know that if they have a different perspective, it will be valued and that they are empowered to use their voice to um, share that. 
uh, that only not only empowers them to take control of their education, but it empowers them to help the other students in the class um, and to help them grow. Uh, I mean, for, since ancient Greece, that's been the point of colleges to um, have a uh, exchange of ideas from this. Um, like I said, ensuring that every perspective is valued uh, and leaning into discomfort when inequities emerge. So that could be um, in your curriculum, um, but it could also be uh, current events that are happening. Um, I'm not, again, not claiming to have all the answers for how you bring this stuff up in a class, um, but there are inequities that emerge all the time. And you have to be able to embrace that that's going to happen and try to do something about it. Uh, before I get into Yoso's uh, community cultural wealth model, um, I have a quick poll for y'all to take. Um, so this is about school uh, segregation. So from 1967 until 2011, I just want y'all to uh, see if there's any history buffs out here, um, or but go ahead and just take a guess on what you think the percentage of black students that were in majority white schools in each of these years. And it's anonymous. I'm not gonna judge y'all if you don't know. Wait till we get, okay, we got the majority in so far. Let's see if we can get two there. All right. So we got two thirds in, we'll, we'll go over it. Um, so y'all are around the right area for the first one, less than 10 or 10 to 20. So in, in 1967, um, this is looking at the South, I should have prefaced with that, um, but the percentage was uh, 14% of black students were in majority white schools in 1967. Um, in 1970, and I mentioned the year before, uh, remember the Titans, everyone wants to make it look like that was the, like the first integrated school, um, but it was actually at 32% that year. So in, integration was already at 32% of African-American students were in majority white schools in 1970. Um, in 1988, that was actually the highest year of integration in our nation's history. Um, we were at 43.5% um, of black students were in majority white schools. Um, over the 70s and 80s, there were a ton of policies that were enforcing integration. Um, throughout the 80s, much of that was overturned um, and uh, was no longer enforced. Um, so integration actually went down since 1988. So it was at 43.5%. Um, in 2011, it dropped down to 23.2%. So we're at about half of what we were at in 1988 um, in 2011. Um, there's been some this, there's been some challenges to this idea of increasing segregation as an issue. Um, some very conservative uh, thinkers have uh, argued that this is more about the increase in diversity than uh, anything else. Um, but the majority um, of scholarship on this topic says that segregation is still a major issue especially um, inter-district. So intra-district, there's um, like inside the district, there is significant, um, there are decreases in de um, segregation. So like GRPS um, as a whole is less segregated, but 
there is more segregation between districts um, and including charter schools are um, extremely segregated many times as well. So uh, we look at that from, uh, as I mentioned, as one of the factors that play into the discrimination um, that play into this uh, hegemonic systems. Um, there is, I think it's about $2,300 less is uh, spent per pupil in these uh, heavily, uh, these schools with high levels of uh, minoritized students. And there tend to be um, about 10,000 students in many of these schools where it's closer to about uh, 1,500 student average in primarily white institutions um, for K through 12. So I, I speak all of that to say there are extreme systemic barriers in place, um, but focusing on the positives, on the strengths. Um, I talked about social capital as being that way to navigate um, the networks of higher education, um, but there are various forms of capital that often go undervalued and unnoticed um, in higher education that are extremely important for our minoritized students. Um, so talking about aspirational capital um, is that belief that you can get somewhere. Uh, there's a lot of research being done recently about hope interventions. Um, I'm, I'm a big growth mindset proponent overall, um, that, that belief that if you work hard, you can change it affects your you know, ability to succeed. However, there's not much strong research that shows that interventions in growth mindset do much for students. The initial research on hope interventions are, is fairly is pretty positive though. So showing them hope that they can get to the somewhere in the future um, has shown early indications that it could be very successful. Um, familial capital, so uh, that cultural, the understanding their culture, understanding where they come from, brings them strength, makes them better able to survive college. Um, social capital, they have many networks outside of um, just the college too. So understanding how to leverage those different systems that they're a part of, whether it's a sports team or a community center or um, any mentor programs, anything like that can be huge for them. Um, Linguistic capital is one that I just love learning more about recently. Um, I think this is one that could be leveraged more by professors um, in higher education in general. Um, this is this idea that there are um, both skills learned from knowing more than one language, but also um, Yoso's research heavily focuses on a lot of her research focuses heavily on uh, Latino cultures. So both native cultures and uh, many Latino cultures have a history of uh, oral, oral tradition and oral storytelling. So this storytelling develops a lot of different skills that are very valuable in higher education, but are not as well utilized as a knowledge base. So that develops uh, timing and rhyme. Um, and patience and so many different skills are developed through this oral tradition and storytelling that aren't truly valued in most higher education culture that focuses a lot more on uh, the written word because that was more of a focus for white culture, essentially. Um, and I'm not saying if there's any English professors in here that writing's not important by any means, um, but it is important for us to analyze why we view the forms of communication that we view as important and recognize that if there is a cultural bias for that, then maybe we need to analyze that more in depth. Um, resistant capital really talks about that idea of grit, um, sort of from a different lens though, that um, many of the minoritized students have had a history of fighting discrimination and adversity throughout their lives. And the knowledge and skills that they've de developed through challenging this inequality have really made them better suited to be successful in college. And this isn't saying to assume that everyone came from a, a difficult situation, but 
in recognizing that capital and talking with individual students, if you, if you are able to identify that, that may be another thing to leverage for their success. Again, capital isn't something to just be used by one person, you know, and, and nowadays our physical capital isn't even physical, you know, a, a, the single dollar is traded, what, seven times in like a minute, you know, so it just keeps circling around. This is capital for each professor to leverage. Um, and it's up to you to decide how you want to use these forms of capital to help the students succeed. Uh, navigational capital, again, is that ability to maneuver through college. This is an area that many minoritized students struggle with um, and may need more help with. Um, the navigating when to use office hours, all those unwritten rules that we talked about, um, knowing when to see an advisor, what classes to take, um, knowing what a FAFSA is or how to apply, all those different things. Um, all right, so all of these are hugely important. Uh, cultural capital is, um, Obviously, each, all of us have our own individual cultures. Um, I just wanted to focus on, though, um, one thing that is common among many of our minoritized students is that they have a tremendous uh, importance placed on serving their community. And that is a, another thing that can be leveraged in terms of keeping that motivation to strive towards college. There's a lot of research that shows that um, minoritized students especially benefit from connecting the knowledge base to them or to the real world. Um, and that's something that's good for all students. But um, it, I think the uh, presenter this morning talked about uh, universal or like focused universalism, something along those lines that doing practices that um, benefit everyone, but specifically would benefit um, certain discriminated against groups even more. Uh, so these, I know I'm running short on time. Um, I wanted to, now I said that I set the framework, I wanna give you sort of some individual things that you can do with students um, to, on a micro level to help the students out. Um, so all of you can be institutional agents. This is just anyone who has that social and cultural capital and is willing to help the students succeed. That's willing to share their social and cultural capital to help them get to where they need to get to. Um, it's easier for me to talk about this because that's essentially my job as a success coach. Uh, I say that if I had to make my job description two words, I'd just say institutional agent. Um, but uh, what an institutional agent done is offers various funds of knowledge. So information about social norms and cultural nuances. Um, so helping them understand what the norms of college are, how to email different instructors, um, how to navigate the different resources and different, like it, this takes work because it's um, hard to acknowledge what all of the cultural nuances are when you've been so ingrained for so many, for many years. Um, you have to advocate for students, um, role model behavior, uh, provide holistic support, and then impart value to feedback, advice, and guidance. Um, I think that that one sort of comes second nature to many professors because that's what you largely do. Um, how you get to that is what I'll get touch on next, but that is hugely important um, in terms of um, building that uh, relationship. So uh, developing that closure or closeness. How do you become an institutional agent? Um, I mentioned this a couple of times that mutual trust and closure. Um, so part of it comes from uh, respecting them as individuals, that they help you grow, you help them grow, um, and that, um, that they can trust you. Um, I mentioned that there's a lot of different things at play here and a lot of reasons why they may not trust a professor to be close to them, um, but it's important to take steps to try to develop that. Um, sharing common ground is one of the huge things. Um, another thing is, like I said, it was establishing those norms. So not just telling them the norms of navigating higher education, but being clear and concrete about what the norms you expect about communication with them individually, what they should call you, establishing what pronouns they use, what they want to be called, um, how in establishing formal lines of communication. Um, but you can share common cultural backgrounds. A lot of the research on institutional agents shows is talking about faculty and staff 
with similar cultural backgrounds, but that doesn't have to be where you find your common ground. It can be from common experiences. Maybe you both struggled in an organic chemistry class or a math class that you can talk about. Um, maybe you struggled navigating college your first time through or um, didn't know your major and have changed nine times. Any, any of those things that you can relate to. The other thing is if you don't have those common experiences, common knowledge about the student's experience being able to under, learn more about them so that you can talk to them about it. Um, the more that you know about it, the closer they'll feel with you um, and understanding what they're going through. Um, and that goes to sort of humanizing their education experience, like relating to them and uh, validating what they're going through, that they're, they're struggling in a class that, um, that they, just realize that they really do need to put in 25 hours uh, for studying time for these couple classes. Um, different things like that, that um, really looking at that. And then proactive and holistic support. Um, really, it, it's hard to be everything to everyone, um, but if they know that they can go to you first, that, that's largely what a success coach role is, is that proactive support. We're reaching out constantly where we try to let them know that we'll help them navigate anything. Um, but even if you can't be all for them, you can let them know that they can come to you with anything and you'll help them get to someone else. Um, we I always say we have tons of resources on campus, but um, I think almost all of them go don't serve enough people that um, need them. So I want to talk briefly, and I'm running short, um, on the do's and don'ts for white faculty as institutional agents. I talked about a lot of them have um, similar cultural backgrounds in the research, but um, these are some areas that research has shown that white faculty, especially at PWIs or predominantly white institutions, have harmed students of color. Um, and that's by being insensitive to other cultures, um, making stereotypical comments, or expecting students to represent their entire race. Um, I know I've talked with numerous students that have been afraid to ask questions in class um, because they're afraid that if they don't know something um, and they're the only person of their race in that class, that if they ask the question, that the professor and everyone else in the class is going to think that their entire race is stupid. Um, and so I'm not saying that, you know, that, that there's a definite answer for this, um, but we can't just be neutral in this. Um, we have to empower the students to feel comfortable that they can trust us. Um, and that will that does take work. Um, again, I'm not saying I have all the answers, but if you develop that trust, um, they're going to be more comfortable to take empowerment of their own education. Do exhibit the genuine interest in their experience and success. Um, and again, I assume that most people that work in a community college do so because they do genuinely care about the student success. This isn't a tier one research institution where professors are forced to teach, you know, and just want, really only want to do research. Um, however, um, many of these students have experienced um, many times where they don't feel that their teachers or professors have cared. So you have to be intentional about showing that. You have to display, you have to exhibit this genuine interest in a way that they understand that you do genuinely care. Um, emphasize academic achievement is easy. Value educational attainment, showing them the importance of it is important. Um, and validating their stu your students' cultural backgrounds. Taking the time to understand where they're coming from. Um, and part of that is exploring, is understanding your own understanding what your cultural norms are and um, embracing how they might be similar or different too. Uh, become an institutional agent. So I threw a lot at you today. Um, I talked a lot about, you know, the democ democratization of education, trying not to get too Marxist with all this, uh, but um, this may seem like a significant change but people don't fear change, they fear loss. Um, what the worry with this 
tends to be is that idea of a loss of power. Um, it's, it seems easier to teach students when you're in control of the classroom. However, by giving up some of that power, some of that control, you are better able to form real relationships with these students and better able to help them have the empowerment to learn on their own and to reach out and connect with you later. Um, so I'm a businessman by trade, my degree's in an MBA. So I, I like models and the change management models and things like that. Um, I threw a lot of stuff at you at the beginning, which may be hard to swallow. Um, so some of y'all may be stuck in that denial or disbelief portion, um, but I'm hoping to move you through to the experiment. Uh, some of this stuff may be frustrating. Um, I know you may wanna say, I, I, I hear this, but I just know that I do everything for my students that I can. Um, but I hope the fact that you signed up for this workshop means that you recognize there are some more institutional factors at play that you can help with. Um, I know I've been in that depression, depression stage before, uh, especially working with GRPS, not feeling like there's enough I can do. Um, but I'm hoping that we can get to this experiment stage where we can try some new things. Um, and, you know, just anything you can do to develop those close relationships. If there's two words I want to harp on with this, it's that trust and closure. So made it through everything and close to the time limit. Um, does anyone have any questions for me about any of this stuff? Thank you very much, Travis. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for putting it together. Oh, my pleasure. All right, so if you have any that come up, if you want, uh, have any questions about any of the research, um, I have a lot of articles, feel free to email me. Um, but yeah, I, I really uh, would encourage looking into Yoso's uh, community cultural wealth model. Um, and Benjamin has done a lot of great research on institutional agent, Estella Mara Benjamin, and uh, I think it's Tara Yoso. So, um, but yeah, any other questions that come up, feel free to email me.